Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, we, I don't see Leah, but if she if she appears and I don't and I miss her, will, will you guys give me a heads up? Yes. Yep. Thank you. Um, awesome. Well, we're so excited to have our second speaker in our alumni summer series. Uh, David um, is a uh, alum, and I'll let him tell you his story. Uh, and he and I met David uh, with Pineapple Club actually when we went to Seattle, and uh, Drake was with us. And he gave us an amazing tour of Pike's Place through the lens of somebody who knows a whole lot about fish, what to look for, uh, what vendors to avoid, which vendors are good. And it was just in, um, in his work uh, with um, marginalized populations in the, uh, on the boats and in the packing houses was, was really amazing and eye-opening and as well as all the eco-sustainability that him and his company um, are working on to keep our oceans clean and, and safe for everybody. So super excited to, to have David here and um, he'll give a little um, kind of update, uh, well, a little talk about uh, his time at Collins College and his kind of career path and then move into the seafood sustainability. And then we'll have uh, time for Q&A. So um, you are welcome to type a question in the chat and I will get to those when the Q&A begins. Um, if you want to just put in the chat during the speak during the talk or just well, feel free to hold on to those um, until uh, until the end as well. So uh, David, uh, welcome and go ahead. Great. Thanks, Ann, and thanks for having me today. Um, so it's been quite a while since I was uh, um, in Cal Poly. Uh, I was there before Collins College existed. Um, so I started uh, when I was uh, 17 years old. Um, in the hotel and restaurant management program that was in its infancy, really. Um, I had been working in restaurants. Uh, my uncle owned a restaurant in Canada that I worked at from the time I was 13 years old. And um, I, uh, I had a long talk with a guidance counselor when I was 15 and, and he, uh, he suggested that I think about career paths and, uh, and I said, well, I know that I, uh, I enjoy working in restaurants and I think I could, I could manage a restaurant someday. So, you know, from there I started looking into uh, programs and um, I, uh, I was living in Southern California at the time and Cal Poly was the perfect fit. So I, uh, I uh, graduated in 1982 and during that time I worked for a seafood restaurant chain that's no longer in existence. And by the time I was 20 years old, I was uh, managing one of the, one of the locations. And um, when I was 21, um, I had graduated and um, they had their own seafood uh, procurement department and distribution. They were self-distributing um, and I went to work uh, in the, the distribution facility. And that's kind of how I got, it, got into um, uh, the seafood industry. That was my start of buying fish on a wholesale basis. Um, I uh, decided that um, I wanted to leave Southern California because um, I didn't think I'd ever be able to uh, afford uh, uh, a house and you know what have you. Uh, so I moved to Seattle. Uh, back then Seattle was a sleepy little town you know, there was Boeing and, you know, the, the timber industry was dying. And uh, so, you know, housing was cheap. And uh, I uh, was working in restaurants um, there. Uh, I, I was working on the Seattle waterfront and I walked through the Pike Place Market every morning. I took the bus across the 
from uh, the suburbs in Kirkland, Washington, over to Seattle and walked down the hill through the Pike Place Market to get to the hotel that I was working in. And I fell in love with uh, the city and, um, you know, uh, my friends were all my, my vendors, you know, the, the, the specialty food uh, distributor and the, the produce guy and the fishmonger. Those were the people that I hung out with. Um, and uh, a couple of years later, um, uh, one of the fish companies that uh, I knew uh, was going through a, a um, acquisition uh, they were being bought out by a guy in, in Oregon who was expanding his business from Portland up to Seattle. And they offered me a job to sell fish to restaurants. And uh, I started doing that um, 31 years ago. And I've been in seafood ever since. Um, what got me started uh, in... Um, the sustainability effort um, was something that happened in Seattle in 1991. Um, that year, um, there was a article in the Seattle newspaper about um, the lake in Idaho that's called Salmon Lake. And you would think that a lake that was called Salmon Lake would have a dearth of salmon but that year in 1991 only one salmon returned to spawn and that salmon was called he was given the nickname of lonesome larry because of course you need more than one salmon to uh to continue that life cycle so lonesome larry spurred my um efforts to try to make sure that there was going to be salmon going back to Salmon Lake when, when my kids were old enough to, to, uh, to go there or uh, uh, that we'd be able to enjoy um, eating salmon, one of my favorite fish um, for, you know, my lifetime and, and on. So I started working on some, um, uh, habitat uh, preservation projects uh, so that um, we take a, a little bit better care of the streams that the salmon were migrating uh, on. Um, and I, I started working on some water quality improvements uh, on those streams so that the, um, the pH would be right, the temperature would be right, so that those fish could uh, could return to where they uh, were born and um, would reproduce. So that's how I got started on this path. Um, I was the least popular fishmonger in, uh, in the country uh, because I started the conversations about uh, seafood sustainability at the Boston Seafood Show, which is our national convention. Um, and that was in about 1998. So um, I wasn't really popular back then. Uh, actually, I don't know if I'm very popular now, but um, I, I, I tend to have uh, um, more um, or less, less eggs thrown at me these days than, than I did back then. So the way I define uh, seafood sustainability is that uh, it's where we catch or and farm fish or shellfish, uh, and it, that allows uh, long-term health for those species, the surrounding ecosystems, and that there's a fair work safety and economic treatment of the people in the supply chain. That last part is, in my opinion, uh, the most important. Um, we have... Uh, had a, quite a bit of a uh, movement um, for uh, the ethical treatment of uh, animals in the supply chain. Uh, Cage-free chickens. Um, well, 
So I'm trying to make sure that we also have cage-free fishermen. Um, there are still uh, issues with forced labor um, in the seafood industry, and there are in other industries as well. But this is the industry that I can have some impact uh, by the by the way that I um, run my business and the conversations that I can have with uh, some of my colleagues throughout the um, restaurant and grocery industries that are usually the last check and balance before uh, a consumer eats the product. So, um, but there's a, a lot more to that than we can really cover today. There is a group, um, it's called the Seafood Task Force, and it's a nonprofit group. It was started uh, about, oh, nine years ago. Um, and I've worked on committees for uh, the Seafood Task Force to uh, try to get a industry standard for how people should be treated. And we've been working for nine years and we still do not have a, um, an agreement all the way through the supply chain for uh, uh, that uh, employee treatment. So it's a complicated issue. Uh, a lot of what is going on now has to do with um, the people that supply labor to the fishing boats. So, you know, the, the, uh, the fishing boat comes into a port, uh, the captain and maybe the few key um, uh, crew uh, work together, but they need added hands on deck. And how those people get those jobs and how they're treated uh, is still the challenge that we're having. Um, there has been progress, it's been slow, and for the last four months, it's been stopped. There's been no, no movement just because of, of COVID. So um, that is also impacting all aspects of the seafood industry right now. Just yesterday, some more articles have come out that the most recent flare up in China uh, was traced back to a fish market and cutting board, cutting salmon was one of the um, uh, points of transmission. Um, you can't, uh, a, a live fish doesn't have the, or can't uh, transmit COVID, but if a, a worker has COVID and is cutting fish and is not using proper uh, sanitation, theoretically um, COVID could be transmitted from the food. Uh, and that is what uh, those uh, are, recent articles are talking about. Um, it's still under review and uh, it's a little bit uh, far-fetched, but um, it, you know, it's a serious enough issue that it is going to dramatically impact the, um, the salmon industry um, for a foreseeable future. Um, also uh, with the slowdown in restaurant, a lot of the higher end seafood items and all of the seafood items that are packaged for food service are having to adjust. Uh, they're either having to uh, decrease their harvest because there's not enough sales or uh, they're switching from one style of packaging to a different style of packaging that works for retail um, and then there's, you know, some of the higher end seafood items that, um, are, 
not making it onto uh, onto restaurant menus right now, and so those supply chains are backing up. Uh, pricing is coming down, and uh, there's you know a significant impact throughout our industry. A um, little bit about where I am now. Uh, I started. Uh, I fell in love with a fish that was um, the first. Um, aquaculture uh, that was a, uh, a sea raised fish. Um, most aquaculture is a uh, fish that has a freshwater life cycle, uh, salmon, trout, carp, uh, shrimp, they can all be propagated in freshwater and then uh, they can be uh, grown out later if they are also a, have a saltwater uh, capability like salmon. Uh, but um, our fish, uh, Hawaiian kampachi, was the first um, fish that was raised completely in captivity that is a saltwater fish. Um, we uh, operate our farm on the big island of Hawaii um, and uh, uh, recently, uh, the president signed an executive order trying to spur additional aquaculture in U.S. waters. Uh, there has been a lot of barriers uh, to increasing aquaculture in the United States. Um, uh, we overcame all of those barriers and have been uh, in business for 15 years. But we've had some significant um, uh, economic uh, challenges in those 15 years. Um, I did not come back full time with this group until uh, the beginning of the year um, because there just it, there wasn't enough market to go after there because fish were too difficult to to raise and to grow and to uh, and to sell. Uh, we've had a, a, a significant investment uh, since the end of last year and we are ramping up for uh, big uh, growth in our uh, particular uh, fish for 2021. Um, and I can answer questions about that later. Um, back to seafood sustainability. So there's a, a variety of, of factors to seafood sustainability that we keep an eye on. Um, so with wild harvest, um, we wanna make sure that we are um, have uh, robust bycatch mitigation plans in place. For instance, uh, one of the most recent advancements for net caught fish, like uh, a purseine caught salmon or a purseine caught skipjack tuna, uh, they, the, there's a big net that is uh, circled around a, a group of fish and drawn up from the bottom. And uh, uh, if those nets are large enough and um, the captain isn't you know, watching close enough, there could be significant uh, turtle, dolphin, whale, seabirds that could be impacted by that net. Um, just this week, um, uh, some trials that I had been doing five years ago uh, with, um, with uh, tuna nets, uh, there's a, a, a new banana ping machine that is clipped onto those nets and it pings a, a noise that uh, dolphins don't like to hear under the water. So they avoid the nets, which is ultimately what we want. We want to be able to take the right amount of fish, and we don't want to take other species that don't belong in those nets. So uh, there's a variety of, of methods used. Some of that is in the gear. Some of that is in training. Um, and um, most uh, reputable seafood companies today 
are using bycatch mitigation methods to be a part of their fishery management responsibility. So uh, you first have to make sure that, there's, that there is enough fish out there to catch. And then you have to manage how much is being caught and by what methods. All of those things are important for sustainability. We also want to make sure that we're not impacting other ecosystems. In other words, we don't want to have a net that's dragging along the seafloor and disturbing coral reefs or other species that are along the seafloor that uh, can be more sensitive. So uh, those um, aspects of harvest have to be taken into consideration. Uh, with sustainability, plastics in the ocean is a, is a very big issue today. Uh, Greenpeace is, uh, is working on, on some improvements. Uh, the Ghost Gear Initiative, which is an industry-led uh, group that um, my former employer was a founding uh, member of, uh, is, is trying to eliminate uh, lost nets ending up just floating free in the ocean, uh, hurting other um, uh, species, and obviously um, uh, uh, hurting the environment. Um, another uh, piece of that is uh, what the tuna industry uses to uh, get the tuna to school up so that they can catch them more efficiently, and that's called a fish aggregating device. And there is a movement with the tuna industry to limit the number of fish aggregating devices that are allowed to be out in the ocean and to change the um, construction of those devices to be more environmentally friendly. Uh, we led a, an effort last year to convert all of our uh, fish aggregating devices to uh, jute and bamboo, no more plastic, no more foam rubber uh, floating uh, buoys, all natural products that will uh, um, uh, uh, degrade in the ocean and not harm uh, wildlife. The biggest problem with plastics in the ocean though is consumer waste. That is the, the, the biggest uh, portion of it and the biggest uh, source of it uh, from, for a percentage standpoint is uh, trash flowing down rivers into the ocean. Um, there's 10 rivers in the world that supply about 60% of the plastic that's in the ocean. So those 10 rivers are very big rivers. Uh, the Yellow River in China is one of them. And if we could decrease the amount of plastics that are flowing out those rivers, uh, the Mississippi is another one um, that would decrease the amount of plastic in the ocean the most. That's the single largest area for improvement. Uh, and of course, single use plastic we are addicted to in this country. And for food safety issues, we're addicted to it in the whole world. So I don't know how we're gonna get away from that uh, especially as the population keeps growing. So speaking of population growth, we are already harvesting the maximum amount of fish that we can out of our oceans. We topped out 20 years ago on what we should have been catching. So the only way to keep feeding people the most healthy protein on the planet which is seafood, is to increase our aquaculture production. Uh, I've been involved in, with aquaculture for 30 years. There were some bad uh, actors uh, originally, uh, but there has been tremendous improvements in aquaculture practices, and um, uh, we, uh, Blue Ocean Mariculture, we're the leading U.S. company for 
open ocean aquaculture. Uh, we uh, monitor our benthic impact, escapement, disease transference, all of the areas where aquaculture got a bad name. We have mitigated those issues and um, uh, we can provide fish that in, you know, in the, in the wild, you could not harvest uh, a million of these, of our Hawaiian kanpachi. There simply would not be enough of them. It would uh, take too much diesel fuel uh, with your boat going around trying to catch them all. Uh, and you would uh, impact other sensitive species in the Hawaiian islands like uh, uh, the turtle population, um, the whales that migrate through. So our aquaculture, I feel, has the best um, uh, impact on the environment and the best uh, long-term protein source of high omega-3, uh, delicious tasting fish. So, um, I'm going to see if I can move my onto the my next. No, I can't. Here we go. No. Um, and I'm having difficulty with this. I don't know why. My. Uh, uh, it's on, I don't know how much I can help you here. Uh, there, we go. there you go. Um. Here's a graph showing uh, wild capture fisheries and aquaculture production uh, through 2016. And you can see uh, when I started in the uh, fishing industry in 1990, um, there was 80 million pounds or 80 million tons of wild harvest and about 15 million tons of aquaculture. Uh, the wild harvest, uh, we keep increasing the number of boats that are out there. We keep increasing the number of days that they are fishing. And yet, 26 years later, we caught virtually the exact same tonnage of wild harvest fish. That tells you that We've increased the fishing effort and the amount of fish that we're catching has not increased. So that means that the total biomass is less. And there's a lot of people that have a lot of opinions and there's scientists that study this full time all around the world. Um, I listen to them and I see this graph and I say, we have to increase aquaculture and at the very most keep wild capture uh, static. So that's why I'm in the aquaculture industry. Um, so how can you make a difference? Um, by the way, these uh, pictures across the top are uh, from um, our operation on the Big Island of Hawaii. Um, those are Hawaiian kanpachi. That's the only fish that we grow. Um, it's a yellowtail species, um, similar to Japanese hamachi. Um, they are native to Hawaiian waters. So if there is any escapement, they're just more fish for the seals and the whales and the sharks to eat. Uh, we use no antibiotics. Um, the fish spawn naturally um, in our hatchery, um, which is on land. So we have a land-based hatchery. Uh, uh, we can uh, get about a million fish a week to um, hatch, uh, and we have about a 92% grow-out ratio. So in other words, of those million fish, 
92% of them will grow to a size where we can commercially sell them. Uh, we're limited right now because of COVID and because of uh, the high costs of, uh, of air freight from Hawaii, but we're putting in a frozen processing plant in Hawaii so that we can move our fish across the ocean in frozen containers uh, and eliminate some of the carbon footprint uh, so that uh, more people can enjoy our fish. So how can you make a difference? Know your supplier. Um, most seafood suppliers are reputable. Uh, get to know uh, your, your uh, salesperson. Uh, visit their facility. Uh, ask their employees uh, how they are being treated. Um, uh, make sure that they have a documented traceability scheme so that you know for sure that the fish that you're getting is what they say that it is. Double check their credentials. Make sure that they are following a, um, a, a traceability program either with the, uh, the uh, Marine Stewardship Council or the Aquaculture Stewardship Council that is uh, recognized for uh, keeping uh, the traceability uh, credentials intact. Now here is the biggest way that you in the, in the uh, food service industry can help me on my efforts. Use the correct description on your menu. Right now there is fish being sold across the country that is being mislabeled, misrepresented. It's economic fraud and it helps the bad actors in the, in the um, seafood industry to, uh, uh, to do illegal fishing. So please use the right word. If, it's, if you're using BASA, label it BASA. Don't label it grouper. The last time I ordered grouper in a, me on, in a restaurant in Florida, I was served BASA, not grouper. Two completely different fish. BASA is cheaper. Grouper is wild harvest. There's so much wrong with that picture. Uh, know if you have wild salmon that's being delivered to you by your supplier, or is it farm raised? Uh, that is probably the, the single biggest uh, error on menus is uh, calling out something as being wild harvest when it was really aquacultured product. Uh, so please use the correct description on your menus. So the picture up at the top on the far right, utilize more of the fish. So every, every uh, seafood supplier that's reputable will take my fish and cut my fish for you and provide you all of those pieces that you see, the frame, which is the, the backbone, the, 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 the fins, the tail, the head, which is down at the bottom. Both of those things normally go into the garbage can and there is a tremendous amount of um, nutritional value in both of the pieces of, of that fish. Learn how to use them. Um, my favorite piece of fish in the world are the collars. You can see the kind of triangular shaped pieces at the bottom. That's usually thrown away. Um, the collars of a kampachi or a salmon or a cod has the best tasting part of the fish in it. And then of course you've got the two fillets on the left and the right side. That's what you are used to selling, but please utilize more of the fish. Uh, try to use more local fish. There's lots of fish that are available in individual marketplaces around the country. Uh, support those local fisher families, get to know them, um, and, uh, and enjoy what, what is available local, as well as what people are asking for. Um, tell more of the story about the fish. Who caught it? Where? When? How? Um, that will allow you to 
be better connected to your guests and to your supply chain. So the three main words about fish is quick, cold, and clean. Um, the time out of the water, the time in transit, those are important. Um, a lot of fish these days is not fresh. Most fish is frozen once, brought to the market and sold as either fresh or previously frozen. Uh, know what you're getting from your supplier. Frozen is not necessarily bad. The best quality fish in the world, in my opinion, is super frozen fish. It's where you take the fish and you freeze it below uh, minus 50 degrees. That stops all of the decomposition, all of the oxidization. That fish will taste better when it gets to your restaurant after it's been thawed out than a fish that is in transit for two weeks. And that's the average length of time that a fish is out of the water and dead and rotting before it gets to your restaurant. So if you want fresh fish, either be close to the source or use frozen. Also, the carbon footprint of fresh tuna. You fly a tuna from Sri Lanka or the Philippines or the Marshall Islands or New Zealand and you fly it to Los Angeles, you put more carbon into the atmosphere than you put tuna into your mouth. So think about that every time that you want to put a fresh ahi tuna steak on your menu or sashimi. Every pound that you use, you put an extra pound of carbon into the environment. Um, I'm getting close to uh, time here to get on to questions. So um, there are food safety certifications for seafood. Uh, make sure that your, your uh, suppliers are not using uh, preservatives and additives. Uh, if they are, you're paying for water. That's not uh, an ideal for, for your food cost. Uh, you're, you're buying scallops and lobster these days that are pumped with 15, 20, 30 percent water by the use of chemicals so that you can think that you're paying a lower price per pound. It's simply not, not realistic. Buy a legitimate product that's not been adulterated and charge a fair price. Your guests will respect you more and you can stand behind your product uh, if you're doing that. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a variety of, um, of places that you can learn more about seafood. Um, I've list, listed some of them here. Um, one thing that I would like to call out is uh, the James Beard Foundation's Smart, Smart Catch program. The Smart Catch program was started in Seattle. Um, I lent a hand at the very beginning. It was started by the former um, owner of the Seattle Seahawks who has since passed away, um, Paul Allen, and uh, uh, his Vulcan Enterprises. He also uh, was one of the founders of a, another little Seattle company, Microsoft. Um, he started Smart, Smart Catch as an effort for restaurants to uh, do what I've been telling you to do. Um, correct uh, names on the menu, uh, traceability. Uh, so if you want to get involved, that, that's a great place to get a start from. Um, I guess we should open it up for questions at this point. Yes, yeah, so we have a couple questions in the chat that, that came up. Uh, Michael asked David, as a 1983 uh, Cal Poly alum from science and a restaurant employee, I'm interested to know what seafood chain you, you, you started off with. 
I worked for the Hungry Tiger seafood restaurant chain. At one point, we had 53 restaurants. I managed the, um, uh, the, uh, the catering, the banquet uh, uh, end of the business. I started in West Covina. Um, then I was the general manager of the location in Corona del Mar and Santa Ana and uh, finished uh, my career uh, running the, uh, the catering uh, out of the uh, uh, music center location. Thanks so much. I remember it well. Uh, ben DeWald asks, what's more environmentally uh, friendly, farm or farm-raised salmon or wild caught? Well, I think that there is a spectrum on both. Um, so first of all, wild salmon is a big topic. Wild salmon right now, the industry is dominated by Russia and Alaska. Um, both of those countries, uh, the US and the state of Alaska and Russia are primarily uh, spending their money on fishery management uh, to uh, grow more eggs in hatcheries and release those um, hatchery fish into the ocean to uh, grow in the ocean and then come back up the stream that they were placed in by the hatchery. So that is what I would call ranched salmon. It's not really wild. It, it didn't start with a genetically diverse uh, salmon uh, that was a wild egg uh, that was fertilized and, um, and uh, uh, naturally went down the stream. So the whole, the, the whole argument of wild versus farm raised is kind of moot the wild salmon industry is run primarily by people that are ranching salmon. They're in the, the state of Alaska and the country of Russia have spent a lot of money to grow a lot of eggs and release them into the wild and compete with native salmon, compete with 100% natural salmon for, for food source, uh, but then also, um, you know, caught for human consumption at the end of their life cycle. So it's a difficult uh, subject. Uh, there are also some aquaculture companies that uh, don't uh, care about the impact of their farm fish on the local uh, environment. Um, those are dwindling and if you want to um, make sure that the farm-raised fish that you are using uh, are, are, um, are reputable, uh, you can go to the Aquac Aquaculture Stewardship Council uh, or the Monterey Bay Aquarium and get information on better choices. Um, I know that um, we don't really have this conversation about about other proteins you know chickens are all farm raised cows are all farm raised pigs are all farm or primarily farm raised um and we don't talk about the environmental impact of those proteins but seafood everybody wants to talk about the environmental impacts of them i think we should have that discussion about all protein and make the best choices uh, for your business and for the environment. And there, there's not a 100% uh, easy answer. Uh, Barbara Jean asks, I follow the Global Aquaculture Alliance. Um, do you have any thoughts on this organization? Uh, they're a good first step. So they, they do uh, some good work, but without the, um, the efforts 
for um, traceability uh, that are required by the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, um, there is opportunity for uh, misrepresentation. Um, not, no fault of Global Aquaculture Alliance. They're doing great work. But if you're talking about choosing a supplier and choosing fish, make sure that you're dealing with a distributor that is certified for their traceability. So you know that what they say that they're giving you is what they're giving you. Because you can say a lot of flowery stuff on a website and once it's cut up and packaged, it could have come from anywhere. So that traceability piece is is vital in my opinion. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. Of course. Um, Michael also wants to know, as consumers, what should we look for or know how to ensure that our purchases, both in restaurants and stores, support seafood sustainability? Well, just like anything, um, know who you're know who you're being served by. You know, I support uh, restaurants and grocers where I've talked to the employees and they know something about these topics. They know something about traceability. They know something about gear type. They know something about what ocean the fish came from. If I walk into a restaurant or walk into a grocery store and ask the person there, the server, the, the, the cook, the, the counter person in the seafood case, where did this salmon come from? and they say the warehouse i don't buy it you know i reward the suppliers that are part of the solution so you know it's called conscious consumerism go spend your dollars where you know that you're getting what you're what you want to be serving does anyone have, from, uh, have a question that they want to uh, unmute themselves and ask? Eric, I see your hand. Yeah, up. so on that topic, what have you, um, is there certain grocers that you run into that are pretty uh, good about having that and that you frequent more often just because you know that they're looking into that more uh, cautiously? And also, what is your recommendation of reaction or, or how did you react in the case that you were served a fish differently than what you thought you were ordering? I asked to, to talk to the chef. Mm. And since the chef wasn't there, I asked to talk to the manager. And I explained that, um, uh, that, uh, that it did, you know, didn't matter to me who made the mistake. It could have been made um, in, the, in the communication between the kitchen and the, whoever wrote the menu. It could have been a mistake from the, the back of the house to the supplier. Uh, could have been a mistake from the supplier to the importer. Didn't matter to me. I, didn't, I wasn't pointing fingers. I just wanted to point out that, that there was an error. And, um, you know, it's an error that could cost the operator a fine if they were found to be misrepresenting something on their menu. And I, I didn't want that to happen to that restaurant. Nice. Uh, as far as um, people that do uh, good, there's a ton of them, you know, if you, uh, if you go on Instagram, uh, you know, follow follow the the, the people that are uh, working in this in, in, for these organizations. You know, follow the people that are um, uh, working at Marine Stewardship Council or the Monterey Bay Aquarium or James Beard Foundation. Follow those people and and do the research. Um, you know the. The one thing about the restaurant industry is it changes, it, it's dynamic. So whatever I tell you today about an experience that I had a month ago or a year ago, it's completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. sure. um, you know, I have a couple of my favorite customers, you know, that, um, that I 
do business with that I think are going to can keep doing the good work that they're doing. Um, so like for instance, in California, um, the, uh, the restaurant chain, uh, sugar fish does a really good job, um, with their seafood sourcing. Uh, the restaurant chain Pacific Catch does a really good job uh, of their sourcing. Uh, up in the Pacific Northwest, uh, Bamboo Sushi uh, does a really good job uh, on their sourcing. Um, and then from a distributor standpoint, there is a group of distributors around the country that are called C-Pact, P-A-C-T. Uh, they include um, Santa Monica Seafood in uh, California. Uh, it includes uh, Seattle Fish in Denver, uh, Fortune Fish in uh, Chicago, Samuels and Sons in, uh, in Philadelphia and in Florida, and a variety of other distributors. Those C-Pact distributors uh, are doing good and are reputable. Um, and then as far as grocers, uh, you know, I would recommend you look at the Greenpeace carting away the oceans, uh, 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 work carting away the oceans is, uh, an article written every two years by Greenpeace. Uh, the gentleman that started it, uh, was a, a former colleague of mine. Um, so, uh, they grade grocery chains but they only grade the, the biggest 25 grocery chains. So, you know, uh, if you've got a local small seafood market, talk to the guy behind the counter or the gal behind the counter and find out for yourself. Thank you. Awesome. We have time for maybe one last question or we can... How about a comment? Yes, one, one last comment, Michael. So I'm going to, uh, and so would Jennifer, my wife, uh, we agree with David's uh, assessment of seafood callers. Uh, for those of you that uh, occasionally go to a sushi restaurant, if you ever see a special with the word kama, K-A-M-A, uh, typically that's a collar preparation, and it's a, it is an amazing way to enjoy fish. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I, I, I used to say that the reason that I was able to uh, build a seafood empire in Seattle is because uh, I started um, uh, selling Copper River salmon and I used to take the collars off of those uh, salmon and uh, and roast them for my staff you know I used to I used to cook you know during the Copper River salmon season I used to cook the the collars for my employees because Nobody wanted them, and um, and that was uh, a good way to good way to keep the employees happy and uh, utilize more of the fish, and also it got them to be talking about uh, one of the best parts of the of the fish with uh, other people. So, absolutely great part of the fish. Thank you so much, D David, for joining us today. I posted a link to your LinkedIn in the chat so people can connect with you on there. David posts some great photos um, out in Hawaii. I think we all want, we need a Hawaiian vacation after looking at your pictures um, that you're posting about your operation. Um, uh, also, Haley's asked for the information on the uh, Greenpeace, so I, I just put that as well on um, uh, for for there. So thank you so much. We'll hang out uh, for about five more minutes here if you have anything you'd like to ask. But other than that, thank you so much for attending. We'll see you all in two weeks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks again, David. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, David.